The earth is our mother. We must take care of her. We are called as keepers of the earth. We are called to speak its sacred worth. Dear choir, dear Unitarian Universalists, dear fellow humans, our home is a hot mess and mom is going to have the last word whether we listen to her or not. There is no one who does natural consequences like Mother Earth. I expect that this is not news to you if you're watching this brand of church service. I expect that like me, the record breaking wildfires, hurricanes, melting glaciers and rising sea levels are all alarming signs that climate change is advancing at a frightening rate. And like me, you may lose sleep wondering if humanity has already pushed the ecosystem we depend on for life past its capacity to sustain us. I'm not gonna hold out any false hope I don't think we can know the answer to this question yet. But neither am I ready to walk around wearing a sandwich board saying the end is near. I think it makes a difference what we do in response to the messages the plants and the animals, the soil, the air, and the water are sending us about the impact we're having on that interconnected web of life. In last week's service, we heard Bird Baylor's story, The Other Way to Listen. It is a beautiful exploration of what we can hear when we pay very close attention in a place where there is no speaking. Although the story didn't say so, I think the girl's success at hearing the hills singing came when she listened not just with her ears, but with her whole being. There are so many ways to listen. And one person who has wrestled with uh, knowing two very different ways is Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer, who told us the story of the five peach stones earlier. As a botanist and environmental biology professor, she has a rigorous training in the scientific method. As a member of the citizen Potawatomi Nation, she has learned from childhood to see plants and animals as members of her extended family. Trees, for instance, are known as the standing people and worthy of respect and reciprocity of care, just as any person would be. I highly recommend that everyone read or reread, if you've already read it, her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, which is an account of her work to reconcile and merge the wisdom of indigenous ways of knowing, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants themselves. I also caution you because I need this awareness myself not to overly romanticize indigenous people or put their wisdom on a pedestal. In speaking to Anne, a dear friend of mine who listens to the earth a bit more attentively than I do, um, partly she spends more time outside and she reads about it and she gardens. Um, and she, reminded me that it was early humans, including the ancestors of modern Native Americans who hunted nearly all of the large herbivores on this continent to extinction, think woolly mammoths, an act that radically altered the landscape by allowing woody plants to flourish. But neither should we dismiss the knowledge of people whose relationship comes from living with the earth in a sustainable reciprocal relationship to the land they occupy. Sometimes we dismiss it because it's not formatted according to APA style or peer reviewed by academic scientists. One of the first books, books I read that opened my eyes to the dangers of modern factory farming was Great Possessions. That's a memoir by Amish farmer, David Klein. And in that book, he described the natural world around him so poetically, um, the world as he experienced it, plowing fields with horses rather than a tractor and leaving wild fence rows between fields, land where birds and animals were abundant. And he compared that to the sterility of the monoculture fields um, of his neighbors that used petrochemical fertilizers and pesticides with increasing uh, abundance. 
Something that I think Robin Wall Kimmerer and David Klein have in common is that spiritual relationship to the land, a reverence for the interconnectedness of species and environment. And Dr. Kimmerer, I'm gonna call her Robin because I wish she was my friend. In her book, she tells a story about participating in a basket weaving class with John Pigeon, a master Potawatomi basket maker. She says the first two rows are the most challenging part of weaving a basket. On the first go round, she says, the splint seems to have a will of its own. It resists the pattern and looks all loose and wobbly. The second row is almost as frustrating. The spacing is all wrong and you have to clamp the weaver in place to get it to stay. But then she says, there's the third row, my favorite. At this point, the tension of over is balanced by the tension of under and the opposing forces start to come into balance. The give and take, the reciprocity begins to take hold and the parts begin to become a whole. She goes on to say, in weaving well-being for land and people, we need to pay attention to the lessons of the three rows. Ecological well-being, the laws of nature are always the first row. Without them, there is no basket of plenty. Only if that first circle is in place, can we weave the second. The second reveals material welfare, the subsistence of human needs economy built on ecology. But with only two rows in place, the basket is still in jeopardy of pulling apart. It's only when the third row comes in that the first two can hold together. Here is where ecology, economics, and spirit are woven together. By using materials as if they were a gift and returning the gift through worthy use, we find balance. Throughout the book, Robin speaks of the idea of honorable harvest, perhaps something those early humans began to imagine and understand after those woolly mammoths disappeared. Although the rules of the honorable harvest are not written down, she says they would include these ideas. Never take the first and never take the last of anything. Never take more than you need and never take more than half. Harvest in a way that minimizes harm. Share, give thanks. Give something in return for what you have taken. Sustain the ones who sustain you. The idea of honorable harvest, she admits, is easier to imagine as you gather berries or fish from a river. She describes going to a mall and trying to apply her understanding of honorable harvest to buying paper and pens, supplies she uses every day in her career as a writer and an educator. She finds the paper easier as she can imagine the trees from which it came, but she stumbles when it gets to the pens derived from plastics as most of them are and finds she can't quite muster the same sense of spiritual connection to the plastic world. My friend Anne, the one I mentioned earlier, who's fairly pessimistic about the future of humanity, asked me what kind of scientist Dr. Kimmerer is as I was enthusiastically sharing ideas uh, from braiding sweetgrass. A botanist, I said, an environmental biologist. Oh. Anne replied, because as I thought about your title, when the earth speaks, I thought of evolutionary botanists. I'm, I'm not really sure the idea of the earth speaking even makes sense. As a planet, I don't think the earth cares or has anything really to say to us. It's for comments like this that I love Anne. She makes me think more deeply, more carefully, and with a deeper curiosity. So, so fine, if you like Anne don't think it's the earth speaking, call it life, the ecosystem, maybe even God. As I sat with her pronouncement, I decided that the interconnected web starts with the rock and the water and the air. And maybe those things don't care about life per se, but 
as humans, we nevertheless benefit from them as part of those first two rings of the basket. And we risk harming ourselves if we exploit them in a way that causes imbalance over time. The fire or the flood may not be divine retribution, but they certainly capture our attention as they should. During the past couple of years, our youth group educated themselves and the congregation about the problem of single use plastics and challenged us to think about the ways we could change our habits. I made the switch to a bamboo toothbrush. And yes, it's easier to imagine the honorable harvest of bamboo than of the plastic handle of my previous toothbrush. I've become more aware of how much plastic pack packaging comes with my shopping. Sometimes now I put things back. I've given up one of my favorite fabrics, polar fleece, because of the way it contributes microplastics to our waterways and our oceans. Now those things alone I know are not going to save us from catastrophic climate change. But as people of faith who say we are committed to affirming and promoting respect for the interdependent web of existence of which we are a part, we are going to be called to do something that goes against our nature as Americans as liberals steeped in a culture of individualism, but which human animals have proven themselves to be capable of. We're being called to sacrifice. We're being called to sacrifice our love affair with the quick and the convenient over the slow and sustainable. We're being called to settle for enough without taking more. We're being called to leave the first and the last and to stop taking more than half. We're being called to stop talking sometimes and listen to other voices, other ways of knowing, other kinds of wisdom that can inform how we move together towards a sustainable human community or separately towards short-term profit and short-sighted policies that could be the end of us all. But the fun part is that as people of faith, we are also called to celebrate the blessings and the joys of living. We are called to gratitude for the gifts we are given because it is in the balance between giving and receiving that we live. I'm grateful for our board of trustees as they grapple with the question of who are the moral owners of this congregation? To whom and to what are we accountable and should we be? A previous iteration of the board decided to name the earth as a moral owner. Now the board is asking themselves and will also be asking you, how could that be? What does that mean? And how could we be accountable to the earth? I do hope you will join them in that wondering and I hope we will find an answer that brings us a sense of deep respect and responsibility as the current stewards of the land our congregation sits on, as well as the larger web that sustains us. Environmental activist Joanna Macy writes, of all the dangers we face from climate chaos to nuclear war, none is so great as the deadening of our responses. In Braiding Sweetgrass, Robin Kimmerer also quotes Macy's work, agreeing with her that action on behalf of life transforms because the relationship between the self and the world is reciprocal. It is not a question of first getting enlightened or saved and then acting. As we work to heal the earth, the earth heals us. It is a beautiful day to do something to heal the earth. When the rain comes tomorrow, as I fervently hope it will, listen to its beat on the dusty earth of New Hampshire and be grateful. Take joy where you find it and share it and offer a gift to the earth in return. The end of the story is not yet written. Amen and blessed be.